We move to the next session, uh, which is our case presentation and case-based viva, uh, which will be on early lung cancer. I would like to invite uh, moderator uh, Dr. Murad Lala, a surgical oncologist from PD Hinduja Hospital, Mumbai, who will moderate this. And I would like to invite uh, the examiners and the students who will be presenting the case, uh, Dr. Jatin, Dr. Harsh, Dr. Lakshma, all from Tata Memorial uh, Center, and Dr. Anbalkan. Yeah. Uh, the examiners, I would uh, like to invite Dr. Bhavesh Parekh, sir, who is our examiner, Dr. Sagar Gaikwad, and Dr. Mehul Thakkar, Dr. Jai Muller Patani. afternoon to all. I thank the organizers for this opportunity. Uh, so now we move on to our clinical case discussion. Uh, yeah. So we present to you a case of a 58-year-old male who is a resident of Medinapur uh, district, West Bengal, a palmer by occupation who had presented to us with uh, the following complaints. The source of the history was patient, and patient's son was the translator during the examination and history taking. So the patient had presented with primary complaints of productive cough since two months, blood in sputum on and off since two months, loss of appetite since two months, and occasional chest pain since one month. Next, So, uh, history of presenting illness, patient was apparently well until two months ago, at which time he developed cough. Uh, initially, the cough was dry and intermittent, but over next two weeks, it became more persistent and productive. Over the past two months, the cough has worsened and interfaced with patient's daily activities like working in his farm, walking long distances and eating food. It is aggravated by physical exacerbation, uh, deep breathing and relieved by over-the-counter cough syrups. Uh, the expectoration associated with cough was initially white, of small quantity, non-foul smelling, and later patient had started noticing occasional streaks of blood in sputum, and in the past two months, he has had two episodes of frank blood in expectoration, about one teaspoonful each time. After the second episode, he has consulted with a local physician and was prescribed some medicines with which this symptom had settled. Uh, patient also reports of having developed loss of appetite over the past two months, Earlier, he used to be he used to have four to five chapatis with each meal two to three times a day, but now he uh, reports that he struggles for eating even two chapatis and reports of not feeling hungry even after manual labor. He also complains of having few intermittent episodes of chest pain, mild to moderate in intensity, located in the upper central chest and non-radiating with no aggravating and relieving factors, and it got resolved uh, by itself. The patient can carry out some of his farm activities and household activities, but has difficulty with strenuous activities and he can care for himself. Uh, no, there is no history of fever, no history of any weight loss, no history of breathlessness, no history of dysphagia, no history of headache, seizure, loss of consciousness and memory loss, no history of bony pains, no history of exposure to tuberculosis, and no history of swellings anywhere in the body. Uh, Past history, patient is a known case of hypertension since three years and he has been taking tablet amlodipine 5 mg daily. Uh, there is no history of tuberculosis in the past, there is no history of similar complaints in the past, there is no history of any surgeries and no history of any other major medical illness. Uh, family history, patient has three brothers and two sisters and no family history of cancer. Personal history, patient is literate, has read till 8th standard, he is a farmer by occupation, he is a reformed smoker of BD, quit 6 months back and smoked about 1 pack of BD every day for nearly 30 years, so that's 30 pack years of smoking. Also reports of having used chewing tobacco for about 2 to 3 years, several years back and then quit, used to have about half a pouch of chewing tobacco daily during this period. 
patient reports normal bowel and bladder habits treatment history uh, patient in the in the past two months he has been treated with oral medicines for hemopsis with which it had resolved but he has no prescriptions available for this he has taken some over the counter cough syrups but no prescriptions for that and he reports no use of painkillers in the past two months to summarize uh, the history is of a 58 year old hypertensive male who is a reformed smoker presents with a two month history of cough hemopsis loss of appetite and intermittent chest pain his ECOG performance status is 1 and my different, uh, our differential diagnosis would be carcinoma of the lung or pulmonary tuberculosis. Uh, moving on to examination, so the patient was examined in a well-lit room after taking verbal consent. Patient was conscious, cooperative, well-oriented to time, place and person. His vital parameters were normal, saturation on room air was 98% and pulse rate was 78% and regularly regular. Uh, respiratory rate was also normal at 20 per minute. Patient's weight is 58, height was 170 centimeter, a BSA of 1.65 meter square, BMI of 20.07 kg per meter square. Patient did not have any pallor, icterus, cyanosis, pedal edema or clubbing. Nails examination was also normal. Oral cavity examination, the lips were normal, mouth opening normal, tongue normal. Poor oral hygiene, tobacco staining of all teeth and loss of left upper premolar and molar tooth was seen. There were no discrete lesion or growth in the oral cavity. Lymph node examination, there were no palpable lymph nodes uh, in the general physical examination. Moving on to systemic examination and respiratory exam. Upon inspection, the trachea is seen central. There is bilateral chest wall movement is symmetrical and equal. There are no dilated veins, uh, no swellings or scars are seen as the spine looks normal. On palpation trachea is central, there are no points of tenderness, no local rise of temperature. On percussion, there is a dull note over the right upper lobe and resonant note present over rest of the lung fields. Liver dullness is percussed from 6th intercostal space to 2 finger breaths below the right costal margin. On auscultation, there is reduced air entry from 2nd intercostal space to the 5th intercostal space on the right side compared to the left upper lung. Normal vesicular breath sounds heard over the rest of the lung field. There is occasional wheeze heard over the right lung and left lower lobe. Abdomen exam on inspection, there is bilateral symmetrical scaphoid shape abdominal central umbilicus. And there is no distension noted, no dilated veins. On palpation, liver is just palpable under the right costal margin and inspiration. It is soft, sharp border, no tenderness. Spleen is not palpable. Testes are normal. On percussion, there is tympanic note over all areas of stomach. Liver span is 8 cm. Auscultation reveals normal bowel sounds. So, and CVS and CNS examinations were normal. So, to summarize, a 58-year-old uh, male reformed smoker, hypertensive, presenting with cough and hemopsis, loss of appetite and occasional chest pain since two months. On examination, he has a dull note on percussion and reduced air entry over the right upper lobe. So our differentials would still remain as carcinoma lung as the first differential and second would be pulmonary tuberculosis. So in workup we would advise for... Yes. So, uh, getting back to your history and your physical examination, why are you putting it as carcinoma lung as your first differential diagnosis? Um, so, so, the patient's uh, clinical characteristic that he's an elderly uh, male, 58 uh, year old male with a strong smoking history, has presented with a two month history of progressive worst, progressively worsening cough associated with hemopsis, loss of appetite. So, given uh, these symptoms, sir, and there is no history of any fever, sir. Given these history, we are leaning more towards carcinoma lung as the first diagnosis and second in tuberculosis. Sir. Uh, Dr. Mehul and Dr. Uh, Jay, if these patients come to your clinic, would this be your first? So, I mean, TB is more common than lung cancer. You'd still think TB first. Also, was there any mediastinal shift or in no, sir, on examination? Mm -hmm. And uh, so still, I mean, TB would be first on my list, especially you're saying you didn't find anything else, no lymph nodes, no etc. So I would put TB first and of course lung cancer is a close second. Also in the background, you've heard wheezes and all. So background COPD, a patient who has been smoking yes. would have cough probably because of the COPD, COPD. part. So smoking history, COPD with primary tuberculosis, as he said, would be our first diagnosis when the patient comes to us. So that's, you need to rule out, you know, breathing difficulty if the patient is having progressive 
Ratna Snell Thakur also explained the Sivapudi part. Any past history of uh, tuberculosis or no. tuberculosis contact? Uh, no history personally or in the family members, sir. no history of tuberculosis. Sir. Uh, to uh, work up this patient to reach to a diagnosis, we would initially start with basic blood uh, CBC, biochemistry, electrolytes, or viral workup, sputum examination for acid pass bacilli, NHRCT thorax, and if the CT is suggestive of suspicious for malignancy, then a PET CT of the whole body and biopsy from the accessible site. I think you missed an X-ray. Yes, 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 Simple chest X-ray. But uh, X-ray, if we are suspecting uh, malignancy as a course, second CT Doesn't scan matter. Any patient that. who's come with cough and hemoclysis, that would be the first thing you do, right? X-ray can be done in like 10 seconds, you get a film also, no? and all the instruments. No? I think this is an important message for all the postgraduates. Just because this is a lung cancer symposium, or you're taking a MCH or a DM or a MD radiation, don't jump to the conclusion that, you know, every case is a malignant case. Go stepwise. Most common, especially in this country, how can you jump to a diagnosis of saying cancer of the lung? I think you have to keep TB high up over there and go systematically. I, you have to have a CT, I mean, a chest X ray before doing an HRCT. And sputum examination for FB as well as for routine microscopy as well as for culture also. That's also a routine. So, uh, we have a CT scan and a CT scan. So, the baseline uh, blood workup was normal, CBC was normal, RFT was normal, LFT was normal, uh, fasting blood sugar was 89 and viral, viral markers were negative. Uh, this is the CCT thorax and abdomen uh, that was uh, uh, done. We have a video of this as well. So, while that uh, video runs, just tell me what is the what will you ask your radiologist for a CT scan? You just write CCT chest. Yes, what exactly will you ask your radiologist? Now you are suspecting <coughs> malignancy. You say, yes, sir. yeah. So, sir, we uh, we would want to know the extent of the uh, primary disease, the medius time. No, no. I am asking you that you are sending, you are writing a investigation. Yes, so you just write CCT chest. And send it across? Uh, no, sir. CCT thorax plus abdomen, sir. Why abdomen? So because uh, uh, lung uh, uh, lung tumor can uh, easily metastasize to uh, liver and uh, other so sp uh, spinal mets could be there. So abdominal CT scan will help us to rule out any distinct metastasis. What what in abdomen? What more? So yes. adrenal gland. There adrenal is, so gland. There is yes. Involvement of adrenal so gland. okay. So now tell me, wouldn't you like to see the uh, this thing, the neck as well, supraclavicular region? Um, yeah. Why? Um, so to see for any um, cervical lymphedema. Pathology. You want to know about supraclavicular lymph nodes? Yes. yes. What else? Again, not very, uh, not very sort of relevant. But even a CT of the neck, which covers the vocal cords, will tell you about the cord status. In indirectly tell you about whether the recurrent laryngeal nerve is involved or not. So your CT scan should be ideally from hyoid down, including the upper abdomen. Yes. So you have to ask. If you just write CACT chest, they'll just do chest and send it back to you. Yes. Send a history along. So yes. yes. Send a history along. The radiologist also will probably screen the neck and the abdomen. Yes. So the CT scan, this axial imaging uh, uh, shows us uh, a large soft tissue density mass arising from the right upper lobe, the posterior medial aspect, uh, closely abutting the right main bronchus. And uh, <coughs> there is a suspicious hilar node also, uh, which we can we will be seeing next in the uh, soft tissue window, a uh, mediastinal window. And uh, in the Abdomen CT scan, could not see any uh, suspicious lesions. This is the soft tissue window of the CT scan. This is the um, bit. This is the CCT of the abdomen showing the abdominal cuts. So 
So this is the uh, final reported CT scan, which was done at TMH. The scan suggested of a heterogeneous, heterogeneously enhancing mass in the right upper lobe, abutting the mediastinal pleura, measuring 7.7 .7 into 5.5 centimeter, with calcific foci within the pleural with pleural tags. It is seen abutting the right main bronchus and encasing the right upper lobe segmental bronchus. Uh, in regional metastasis, there was note of enlarged uh, right hilar lymph node measuring 1.5 into 1.2 centimeter with foci of calcification and there were no effusions noted and there was no other distant metastasis noted. So uh, the PET CT patient had done outside, I apologize for this image but this is the only image was with, which was available for uh, uh, depiction. So this is the PET CT which was done outside of TMH, uh, which again shows, shows a right upper lobe a metabolically active heterogeneous mass. Uh, this report was report this uh, CT uh, this PET CT was reported outside, which uh, concurred with the CT scan suggestive of a uh, soft tissue mass in the right upper lesion, meta which show with FDG avidity with SUV max of 16.8, and a mild compression of the distal portion of right principal bronchus without any obvious invasion. Uh, in PET CT, there was no hypermetabolic mediastinal or hilar adenopathy, and physiologic uptake was seen in the rest of the body, and there was no uh, metastatic lesions anywhere else noted in the body. Uh, this uh, the lung my lung mass biopsy was done at TMH, which was suggestive of an adenocarcinoma. The cells were uh, non-small cell carcinoma arranged in solid patterns, and on IHC, they were positive for TTF1 and CK7. Uh, MRI vein again was done at an outside center because of logistics. Uh, then uh, there was a normal study. Uh, images were not available for this. Uh, so our final impression was adenocarcinoma right upper lobe, clinical stage T4, N1, M0, stage 3A by the AGCC 8th TNM classification. And to plan... So there was a CT and there was a higher... Pet didn't show. Pet didn't show, sir. You can bust or something. So, uh, we, for the planning, we mentioned for even. We, we did a CT guided biopsy. Yes, sir. You did not have a bronchoscopy on this patient. Uh, sir, uh, no, sir. <coughs> EBS we have done later, sir. But. Uh, uh, okay, forget this case. Yes, now sir. the patient comes, you've got a. You said you've got a right upper lobe. You've got a right upper lobe mass. Yes, In, involving, you said the main bronchus, is it? Uh, sir, abutting the main bronchus. Abutting the main bronchus, okay. Would you ask for a bronchoscopy or would you. Skip that at this point of time. So we'll ask for a bronchoscopy. To Why? To see whether there is actual bronchial infiltration and we can do a transbronchial biopsy of the right upper lobe, sir, the lesion, sir. Okay, would you prefer that or would you prefer a CT guided biopsy as you have done? Um, so CT guided biopsy is more uh, technically easy for the patient also, sir. But it's more invasive. Uh, it's it's more. In COPD, you saw a lot of bullet there. Yes, sir. Miss the biopsy. Uh, yes, so again, wherever possible, if you, uh, if you think it's a post central lesion or coming to the central part, you do a bronchoscopy. If you see something there, you take, it, uh, take a biopsy from that. You can avoid an invasive procedure. So, once you had CT scan, thorax, abdomen, as well as PET scan, and now you have a two option either you go for CT guided biopsy or either you go for bronchoscopy. Because you also mentioned that in the CT scan there is a lymph node, yes, but in the PET scan it PET was scan not there. Yes, so also you want to uh, know the sampling or the nodal sampling. Yes, so sir. whether now you had a true choice, either you go for CT guided biopsy or you go for bronchoscopy or you ask your pulmonologist to intervene. What's your choice? So, sir, with bronchoscopy you can plan for EBUS also. So endoscopic bronchoscopic ultrasound will help us know, uh, know the mediastinal nodal status uh, also, sir. And with bronchial biopsy or transbronchially, we can do, sir, of the mass. So is there any data like what are the chances of becomes bronchoscopy negative or city guided has more complications? Um, sir, I'm, I'm not aware of this. How would you assess uh, the lymph nodes in a CA lung patient? What are your methods to assess whether the lymph nodes are involved or not involved? We can, uh, it's all, it's all. We can assess through uh, endobronchial ultrasound and uh, mediastinoscopy. We can uh, uh, assess the lymph nodes, uh, mediastinoscopy. So, which one would you prefer? Mm. 
I will first to go for endobronchial ultrasound followed by media, invasive media scope. So basically this panel is on early, early lung cancer. Early lung cancer presuming that on imaging there are no nodes. Okay. On the PET. On the PET CT and even just say a CT scan also does not show any nodes. Yes. You still want to stage the... Yeah, yeah. Show, yeah, yeah. Okay. First, uh, before uh, going before surgery because it will become N2 where it will... The uh, management will totally change. Correct. Therefore, so um, you said that's you must follow, are followed by if need media stenoscopy. Yes. Yeah. Nowadays, e is better, but in case you have, when you do a metastinoscopy, in spite of e being negative. On PET, it shows positivity. Correct. But on e we get it negative, yeah. then the video assisted metastinoscopy. So, Jesse, your imaging is showing an enlarged node or a suspicious node, and your e is negative, you will still go in that group of patients and do a metastinoscopy. There are some nodes which you can't tackle with e and Yes. Yeah. So, which, which nodes will you not? By Level 6 node, subiotic node, uh, it cannot be tackled by EBUS. For that, we need to do a TNS scope. And what is Chamberlain's procedure? Interior media stenoscope. Very important because the second intercostal space on the, on the left side, that's for the station 5 nodes. I want to Okay. Okay, then. So, uh, for this patient, uh, our plan would be to do a pulmonary function test assessment, a cardiac assessment with ECG and 2D ECO, uh, EGFR, PCR on the um, tissue biopsy, and EBUS to look for mediastinal nodal status, a PDL1 testing, and if there is no N2 disease on EBS, then NACT plus immunotherapy followed by reassessment for surgery. So, why are you planning surgery for this patient? So, uh, sis, this is a uh, either T4, N1 or N0 disease. Uh, so radiation is more helpful when there is N2 disease or N0 disease. If surgically, <coughs> technically feasible, then surgery is preferred over radiation, sir. And since this patient has T4, uh, stage 3A disease, he will warrant chemotherapy. And it's, uh, although adjuvant and neoadjuvant chemotherapy both have provided equivalent outcomes, but if we give neoadjuvant chemotherapy, the patients are able to better tolerate the chemotherapy and complete the entire cycle, sir. All patients in your preoperative uh, biopsy, will you do uh, the NGS or the PDL1 or EGFR? Um, so if the, if the patient, okay, in this case, yes, sir. early cancer comes. So EGFR we would do because now we have data for adjuvant osimertinib, uh, which has provided good DFS and overall survival benefit. So if the patient turns out to be EGFR positive, then irrespective whether we give adjuvant chemotherapy or if patient is deemed not fit for adjuvant chemotherapy, we can give um, osimertinib in the adjuvant setting if the patient is EGFR, L850 are mutated or exam 19 delete mutation, sir. No, so you're looking, you're saying in adjuvant treatment. Yes. But we are thinking of surgery in this case. So now why not send the final sample for these studies? Why do you want to do it on the biopsy? So, so both are acceptable. Uh, biopsy, uh, as per the NCC, uh, uh, the surgical specimen can be sent also and the tissue biopsy which was taken can also be used for EGFR testing, sir. Uh, if you are planning for new adjuvant, then we can take okay, a biopsy. Which, which early lung cancers will you plan for new adjuvant chemotherapy? If the uh, centrally located, if it's going if it's going for, if you can avoid pneumonia, it can be major lesser resection and if you are, if you are planning for lesser resection, means submental <coughs> ISM, then, then we can go for neoadjuvant chemotherapy to reduce this and then we can go for surgery. Okay, so we'll the basic principle is you want uh, your patient to be on table. So if you can resect it, you go ahead. If you can't, then you will go with NSA. You are a surgical? No, sir, I'm from medical. So, surgical. Angur, tell me, uh, okay, you're planning surgery for this patient, uh, early lung cancer. So, how do you assess whether your patient is fit for surgery? I will do a pulmonary function test for the patient. First, I will assess the comorbid condition okay. and uh, performance status. Then, I will uh, do the pulmonary function test whether it is uh, um, whether he can tolerate the 
what surgery? So what do you look for in the pulmonary function test? I will look for FEV1 and uh, mm. uh, and then followed by I will see for uh, cardiac activity also I will see for. So only FEV1? Yes. DLCO also. DLCO. So what are your cutoff values? What the 90% percent you can do? If you want is more than 2 liters, then you can straight away take for pneumonectomy, if you need a pneumonectomy. If it's less than 2 liters, then you need to look at whether it's you know 80% or less. If it's less than 80%, you might want to look at DLCO. If that is uh, also below 60%, then you might want to look at other things like your CPET or you know, uh, VO2 max, etc. Try to predict in such cases, do a predicted post-operative uh, or yes. FEC and FE1 and then decide for surgery. So patient, patient is borderline or borderline <coughs> Depend upon the uh, means if it's a patient with comorbid condition is fit now, then we can go for uh, minimal invasive surgery. Sir. What 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 surgery do you do? What do you aim to do? Are means, you for all no 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 sir. Okay. Uh, I will go for uh, mostly lobectomy. Yeah. If possible, then sub lobar resection. Okay. Okay. Means lobectomy. Yeah. Lobectomy. lobectomy. Is the right answer. Yeah. In exams, always say standard of care that is lobectomy. Okay, don't go for a sub lobar resection. Okay. Lymph node. Yes. Lymph node. Lymph nodes. Lymph nodes. Yeah. Now lymph nodes. Will you do lymph node sampling, or will you do lymph node dissection? I will do lymph node dissection. How many stations will you remove? Minimum. <coughs> okay. A minimum of three stations need to be removed if you are doing it for early lung cancer with uh, uh, N zero, clinically N zero, and radiologically N zero. Okay. Okay, anything about uh, adjuvant treatment would anyone like to add? Yeah, so as a medical oncologist, suppose this patient already, as you rightly told, it's NACT plus IO. Again, uh, single agent IO, double agent IO, and what is NACT? Uh, which agents of NACT? Uh, sir, new adjuvant chemotherapy would be mostly a platinum doublet, sir. And in immunotherapy, it will be single agent nivolumab, sir. We can give an immunotherapy which has been studied. So, how many cycles and so what should be your follow up imaging modality to decide when reassessment for the surgery? So, for three cycles of chemotherapy plus immunotherapy every every 21 days, and the follow up imaging pre surgery should be a PET CCT again, sir. Okay. So suppose this patient is already now you had referred for a surgical oncologist and has been done a lobectomy and the final histopathway is YPT3N1. What should be your adjuvant treatment? So for adjuvant treatment uh, uh, for these patients, uh, if the resection was R0, sir, and we can give atezolizumab immunotherapy, sir. So if this patient already you also mentioned is the EGFR positive then? If if EGFR positive, then we will not give immunotherapy and we will go to osimertinib, uh, 80 milligram daily for three years at least or till any uh, any major toxicity, sir. And if the same patient, rather than using immunotherapy, if your pdl one is negative and EGFR is positive, are you going to combine NACT with TKI or only NACT? Uh, 
only NACT cell, but PDL1 uh, negative also, so we can give immunotherapy in NACT cell. The uh, magnitude of benefit is more for patients who are PDL1 positive, but it can, the benefit can also be seen in patients who have uh, low PDL1 or PDL1 negative cell. So, respectively, we can give uh, uh, IO cell. So, either you give adjuvant immunotherapy or you give EGFR positive than osimaritinib, any role of adjuvant chemotherapy? Sir, if it is an R0 resection where we are given uh, three cycles, then we can give three more cycles of uh, adjuvant chemotherapy, sir. And then we can stop after that, sir. No role of maintenance chemotherapy, sir. Uh, question to all. Indication for adjuvant radiotherapy in this particular case? Sir, if it were an R1 resection, then we'll plan for adjuvant chemo uh, chemo radiation we can give or if we have to plan this, then first we'll give chemotherapy and then sequentially we'll plan for adjuvant radiotherapy, sir. If it is an R1 Possible risk. indication, if it's a, it turns out to be a N2 Yes. Suppose by chance this patient is inoperable from a surgical oncologist's point of view, even by NACT and IO, is there any role of chemo radiation concurrent? Yes, sir. Of can. same patient? Yes, sir. We can give definitive chemo radiation to attempt to cure the patient if surgery is not feasible after. Uh, after therapies. Only radiation? Chemo radiation chemo, both? Chemo radiation both, sir. With immuno, without immuno? So without immunotherapy, sir. Any role of HBRT in this particular patient? In this particular patient, no, sir. But if node negative? So even if node negative, the primary mass is too large, sir. If uh, it the cutoff is of 5 cm. 7 cm to 1. Uh, who is not answered anyway? <laughs> okay. Uh, a patient has had COVID. During COVID, during the screening of workup for his COVID, he's found to have a ground glass opacity about one centimeter in size. How will you work up this patient? We look for a solid component. Is there any solid component that is? Uh, if there is no solid component, then we, we maybe a post COVID change. We can follow up a CT scan after three three months and look for any. Uh, and change in the size of uh, uh, of the lesion. And then, would you want to investigate? Would you want to needle it? Uh, so, if it is uh, uh, if it is large enough, uh, the size is increasing, then that may indicate a, a progressive disease. This may be the sign of malignant uh, malignancy. So, if uh, then we, we can do a biopsy, depending on the size, whether even uh, mostly CT guided biopsy, then we need to do one. Anything? Okay. Maybe three cycles of chemo and repeat a PAP. People forget that. You get a lot of lung toxicity after that. Okay, I think it's time up. So thanks. Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you.